Hello, I'm here with Calvin. Can you hear me, Calvin? Okay, you're just going to be my audience number one. Uh, we're at the hi, it's good. Uh, we're at the Falcoin booth, and I'm going to be asking. So, we're at the last day, and if you've ever been at a conference, Calvin, have you? Been, you you've been here for the whole hall. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, we know that it's all right. I'm not going to do the whole thing to you. So. <laughs> so you will know on the last day of a conference, uh, people's minds naturally uh, tend towards their own mortality. Uh, in the I feel like death, and so I'd like to expand that sensation to uh, include uh, the question: uh, What happens after we die? Um, which is a little big for like, you know, a standard booth in, uh, in consensus, even though we cover the big issues here. Um, so perhaps to make it a little bit more applicable to your current life and also to stop this getting too morbid, um, I'm going to talk about uh, corporate debt. I'm going to talk about what happens when companies die or when other institutions die. Institutions have like a fascinating range of, uh, of lifetimes. Like there are some institutions, there are some organizations that last for thousands of years. People probably know that Japanese uh, companies have existed since I believe the 1300s and, um, and many uh, of the very first uh, corporate entities still exist today. I was reading uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago about the timescale of IBM. Uh, uh, IBM is now uh, over a hundred years old uh, and so in some ways predates the computer that we associate uh, IBM with. It actually not only was a corporation that was started uh, when computers were just tabulating machines, it actually even precedes that. It, its roots are in the mechanics of uh, of calculation itself. So one can conceive of a corporation that would exist across incredible timescales of technological development, kind of hopping from one format to another. And um, uh, you see that now, right? You see companies, not just IBM, who've managed to survive the turmoil of technological change. Um, uh, you'll have seen this in your lifetime no matter what age you are, really, because you will have lived through some major transformations in how media is stored, right? So I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm turning... I'm turning slightly pale because, as I say, it's the last day of the convention. But I'm also turning kind of gray, and I've seen that 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 media transformation happen. And mostly, it's been in the physical realm, right? So uh, my parents will have uh, uh, enjoyed music. In, well, actually, my parents and my children will have enjoyed music using vinyl because vinyl has its own kind of life scale and currency, right? But um, uh, of course that would later on would turn into CDs and uh, the same in uh, visual media. You would go from uh, um, film to uh, cine eight to uh, videotape to uh, DVD uh, to downloading films to streaming. So media and uh, data can exist through multiple mediums, but that transition is always kind of uh, risky. And uh, it always risks creating what the science fiction author Bruce Sterling uh, called uh, uh, dead media, right? Dead ends where something is preserved and stored, right? Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it, it chooses an evolutionary dead end. Right, so you decide to record all your greatest memories on uh, on eight track tapes, right? And so they're inaccessible any moment. I have a vast cache of those little Casio cameras to which I have lost any kind of cable to. So I know there's data in there, but I have really very little idea about how to get it out. I have an amazing, well, amazing to me, uh, thing in the uh, very early days of GPS. Um, I had like, I, as you can probably tell, I'm a gadget fan. And I had this amazing kind of 
early, I'm, I'm, it's going, going larger in my head, but, but it was about this big. It was a GPS device, right? So it wasn't like built into my phone. It wasn't built into my car. It was this handheld thing that again, talk about dead media, had these dedicated cartridges that you would plug in that would give you the maps to wherever you were trying to go to and you would buy those separately. And I actually took those to one of the early uh, Burning Man uh, conferences conferences. God, oh my God, like I told you, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a conference zombie now. Burning Man is not technically a conference. But anyway, I went there and I mapped out the whole of the early Burning Man. And if you've seen those aerial photographs, you'll know that Burning Man is, is huge now. And this was a, a much smaller space. Um, I can't get those out because it's stored on those dedicated cartridges, right? So what does this have to do with death? Um, well, so much of your life right now is stored digitally, right? And so much of your life is probably stored not on a little cartridge uh, 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 so that you have some promise that it's accessible, but you probably don't actually know how it's stored, right? Because it's stored on the cloud. We've kind of, in those, those movements through media, um, we, we, we've, we've etherealized away the idea of the physical base to that content, right? Like we went from going, oh yeah, for instance, right? I have, I bought this because mortality is on my mind recently. I, uh, uh, one of the best preservation mediums I am told that you can have is, um, is uh, read writable um, uh, Blu-ray. Blu-ray discs, which I, 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 I kind of transitioned through Blu-ray. That never really hit me. I went straight from um, uh, uh, entirely legitimately uh, purchased downloads of videos to uh, to streaming. So Blu-ray, I would have thought, would be in some ways a dead media. Although media fans may um, disagree with that. Actually, it's a very well-preserved medium because uh, Blu-ray. Uh, if you manufacture it in a certain way, can be preserved, they say, for like 100 years or so. So people will back things up onto, onto Blu-ray discs. Um, so that's, that's a physical substrate. And, and in the same way as you talk about archival media, right? That's a way, because you're in contact with the physicality of the medium, you have some idea about how long this is going to stay around. And if I'm recording stuff on something that's preserved for 100 years, unless I become immortal, which is still one of those, you know, I, like I say, I'm a gadget fan. So as soon as immortality comes out, I'm probably going to buy those pills. Um, but assuming the worst happens and I don't last that long, that's going to be the media that will proceed past me, right? That will be the media that um, it, it exists beyond uh, uh, my own existence. But we don't have those guarantees anymore, right? We don't have that idea of like archival media. What we have is our data stored in probably the least kind of physically reassuring metaphor that you can construct, right? Which is the cloud, right? The idea that anything could be stored permanently in a cloud is, is it's probably a poetic way of saying, no, that's really not going to happen. Um, so let's rewind a bit and see if we can predict in the same way as maybe in the 1880s, you could have predicted that IBM would succeed and maybe DEC would fail or something like that. Maybe there would be some algorithm that could say, you know, I'm going to store my data um, in, there were two competing formats uh, in the 19, 50s, I'm going to say, uh, about how you would record even text. So there, uh, there was ASCII, which you actually all use. So when you type and store and send data these days, it's recorded um, in uh, numbers that were originally invented to uh, convey data on teletypes and the clattering automatic typewriters of the time. But there was another format uh, that IBM uh, uh, pushed for called and I think it, it didn't succeed because it's not as pronounceable. Um, it's EBCDIC. And also, if you're going to make an acronym, don't put DIC in it. I think that's going to limit your marketing ability. Anyway, EBCDIC faded away, and so all of that data became much harder to preserve. 
Um, so some of it is about formats, right? Some of it is how do you, how do you preserve formats over time? Uh, there's a, a group at the moment researching how to preserve um, personal knowledge databases. It's a great project. Unlike many of the ones I'm going to talk about, we don't actually sponsor this one, but maybe we should. Um, to introduce myself, 20 minutes into this talk. My name's Danny O'Brien. I work for the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. I'm a senior fellow there. And um, uh, Filecoin as a storage system uh, has a, a long-term interest in the long-term preservation and storage of our ultimate goal, which is to store um, uh, all the world's uh, uh, information. We still say all the world's uh, most important information, but that's really to like, give ourselves a doable goal, but you know, our stretch goal in the Kickstarter of our lives is we're gonna store everything. Um, and we, we kind of have the resources to do that because of the way that Filecoin incentivizes people to uh, make data storage available. We currently have about over 10 exabytes of storage. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Flo. It's uh, yeah, over seven exabytes a day. Um, so uh, we're able to offer that space uh, to store this information. But what format do you store it in? And how do you keep that data uh, stored forever? These are the things we kind of think about. And we have a kind of chilling um, uh, 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 a guy with a scythe and uh, a cloak kind of following me at all times. Um, you can see where my mind is in this current, uh, this current life. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we know that data evaporates, right? We know that data has a, a, a life cycle, and it's actually kind of shocking how short that life cycle is. Um, when uh, media was copied from vinyl to CDs uh, and reformatted, I, I literally do remember, I was like a wide-eyed, as I say, gadget-loving kid, and so CDs were super exciting, and I remember them saying, you know, these things, uh, uh, last a lo lot longer than vinyl, right? They're going to last forever. <laughs> Remember, in the demo, the TV person was like going, you can just smack them like this. And looking back at the video as someone who had CDs, I was like, no, they're not really quite as defensible as that. Um, uh, so you don't really know how long things are going to last. The presumption was is that we move from analog to digital, from vinyl to... Um, to uh, binary, uh, that um, that would actually lead to data being preserved longer, right? That was genuinely the thought and the idea that we were preserving things in this uh, uh, more um, sort of uh, uh, a realm untied by these the physical decay of something like vinyl, that it would last uh, for much longer. And in fact, that didn't happen. And the early days of the web, as we were creating this network of the world's knowledge, uh, the assumption was is all each one of those links would last forever. As it turns out, the average length of one of those links where you can click and have a guarantee that you will get to something at the end rather than a 404 page is actually about 72 days, right? So, so that's, the, that's the peak. I say that very precisely, and I don't actually know whether it's 70 days. Let's say 70 days, a couple of months. Let's get the, the significance of this. Um, uh, correct. So that's an incredibly small amount of time for something that's supposed to be a permanent repository of the world's information. Um, one of the projects that we do support that you may have heard of is the Internet Archive. And we work pretty closely with the Internet Archive, which was created by a very uh, far-thinking uh, person, Brewster Kale. Uh, and Brewster, in the early 90s, realized that this, that we were we were spinning a, a, a million digital plates, right? And as we spun up new websites, the other ones were, were falling off. So Brewster set about uh, recording every web page. So if you've ever used the Wayback Machine or something like that, that's pretty much down to one person's determination to keep all of this going. And the Internet Archive is a fantastic project and it stores all this information. If you ever go to San Francisco, um, I totally recommend you uh, hitting up the Internet Archive because they do these amazing Friday lunches uh, where they'll show you some of the bits of the archive that there is, is not shareable to the rest of the world right now. They have an amazing uh, 72, uh, talking of vinyl, 
um, the very old vinyl records that they've been painstakingly digitizing to preserve them in that way. Um, so, uh, so the Internet Ar Archive exists. Uh, one of the challenges of the Internet Archive is there's just one of them, right? And um, due to the uh, uh, exigencies of the digital revolution being based around Silicon Valley, that single stored copy of the whole of the internet and its history is in an earthquake zone. So, uh, and Brewster likes to say, um, uh, uh, the thing you should know about libraries, and the Internet Archive is a library, it's a library of mankind right now, is that libraries burn, right? One of the longest living institutions that we know of, right, is libraries, um, because they're connected to the state and they're also a social resource. But libraries always burn. The reason why we know about the Library of Alexandria, um, uh, uh, one of the, the biggest stores of human knowledge and uh, its disappearance was one of the heralds of the, the Dark Ages, um, is not because, um, just because it burnt and that story, but it actually burnt several times, right? The reason why we know about this particular library is because it was destroyed and then rebuilt several times. So we have a record of the library itself through that kind of repetition. There are hundreds of thousands of other libraries that we don't even know about their existence because they burnt so resoundingly. What does a library burning on the internet look like? Now let me point you to some examples. Uh, in 2009, uh, there was a website that was very popular in the, in the 90s, um, a bit like AHA, um, uh, the, the, why AHA, um, uh, uh, called GeoCities. Is anybody here old enough to know GeoCities? Okay, so a few people are nodding, right? So you will possibly remember that GeoCities was uh, passed around, right? So it was bought by different companies over time. And then I think it landed in Yahoo, which basically is sort of the cemetery of, of internet companies. Um, people get bought by Yahoo to die. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, the lawyers may want to check on me saying that. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't want them dying me. Uh, but uh, GeoCities was shut down in 2009 with very little warning, right? And this, uh, for those of you who don't know, GeoCities was kind of like a site where you, you could create your website very easily. And uh, because they hadn't, you know, come up with the idea of domain names or usernames at that point, uh, uh, everybody had like a little different neighborhood. Um, and so they would create these little websites in these neighborhoods. Well, all of those neighborhoods were raised to the ground in just a few weeks. And there was a desperate volunteer effort, uh, led actually by people uh, strongly connected to the Internet Archive, to download and store all of that information before it disappeared. Uh, the Internet Archive, if you can't make it to San Francisco, I hardly recommend to your online exhibit because uh, Internet Archive has the GeoCities Museum of Animated GIFs. Um, because everybody on GeoCities would have a little, um, uh, uh, this site still being worked on and dancing frogs and um, uh, hamsters and all kinds of things. And those are preserved for posterity. I don't know whether that's part of the world's most important information, but it's a significant social element of what was happening there. Um, so that was a volunteer effort, right? Uh, um, and it was something that had to be done very, very quickly. And one of the tensions there was you have this uh, site shutting down, so resources are being stripped from it. At the same time, is it's probably been more popular than it has been for the last 10 years of its life, right? Suddenly, everybody who goes, oh, I remember my GeoCities site is going there and trying to save file and save these things. And this is, uh, this is what um, uh, I've seen described as a thundering herd problem, right? Where you suddenly get lots of people going to a website that is already on its sort of last legs and that actually brings down the website uh, and ends it prematurely because it just can't take it anymore it's like going up to your aging grandparents and like shaking them and saying tell me everything that you know um, uh, it's not good for them it's probably not good for your mental imagery um, so uh, 
So what do you do? How do you, you deal with this? Another organization that the Falcon Foundation and our nonprofit part, the Founda Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web is supporting is uh, Flickr.org. So who here, now we go through the generational stages, the vinyl, CD, streaming stages, right? Who here uh, knows Flickr? Okay, right, so slightly wider, slightly, um, slightly younger generation. Flickr was fascinating because it was really first, one of the first uh, social uh, media uh, um, uh, sites. Um, bought by Yahoo, interestingly enough, which is a key part of this story. Um, so Flickr not only became a repository of everybody's photographs, my, my own child, who's 22 now, uh, check that too, um, uh, is um, uh, all her, her childhood photographs, uh, uh, basically the whole of the most amazing part of my life is all preserved for now on Flickr. Um, Flickr was bought by Yahoo and then was uh, sold on and there was a moment where it looked like it was going to be shut down. And that meant that not only did all of those photographs go away, but actually a huge historical record for um, uh, uh, the whole world because Flickr's uh, launch coincided with uh, the a project that um, uh, we also support actually, thinking about it, uh, the Creative Commons project. Does anybody know Creative Commons? Okay, nodding slightly like, yes, good. Excellent, Creative Commons um, is a project to, it's almost a side effect that it preserves data. Creative, one of the things that, that reduces our ability to preserve data is actually ironically copyright. So copyright, you would think, would be an excellent way of preserving data because it's you know that idea of owning your own data, storing information and stuff. But actually copyright stops you making copies, right? Copyright is explicitly a rule that says, um, uh, before you make a copy of this data, like you have to ask permission of the copy rights holder. So what happens if you don't know the rights holder, right? What happens if the rights holders died and, um, and the ownership of that piece of knowledge is, uh, is in question, right? These are, these are called orphan works. And orphan works often uh, fade and disappear from the world because literally even the people who love them the most don't know legally how they can make copies. And uh, an adage in the archiving world, uh, and one of the basis really of like Filecoin is, uh, is locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. In the digital world, you don't want to take a disk or something like that and put it into a safe, right? You want to make multiple copies of it, right? You want to create lots and lots of backups so it's more resilient. And that's how the Filecoin network preserves these things. We always, when people store data on the Filecoin network, we have a decentralized set of nodes um, from people geographically distant, uh, heterogeneous in there, how they uh, store the information, uh, and with even different business models. So you can store data on the Filecoin network and, and uh, negotiate how many copies that you get stored, and they get stored by, replicated by all of the uh, different uh, organizations and companies in different countries. So that's how we build in some of the resilience there. Um, in the case of data, right, you want to create all of these uh, 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 copies to preserve things for, for, for long, the longest time. It's one of the reasons why during the dark ages, the things that we have the best knowledge about are, um, are Christian apologetics, right? Um, it's because the, that kind of information was stored the most commonly. And if you think about how people are going to um, see the modern day, I think you have to think about like, what is the data that is most commonly stored, right? What is the information that there isn't gonna be a unique single copy about, but it's the thing that's gonna be on everybody's devices. Which brings me to um, the thing that we began with, right? Um, for those of you who joined later, I came in and said, what happens after we die? And it was a mood shift, I have to say. Um, but, but, but one of the questions that we have to ask is if we store stuff in the cloud, right? What happens, well, first of all, what happens after you die, right? This is something that I'm encouraging people to think about as, as a sort of um, archivist and somewhat morbid personality, right? Think about like how, <laughs> how you, um, 
uh, how your, your loved ones are going to be able to access your data if something, God forbid, happens to you, right? I know we tell people don't keep passwords on a piece of paper. I suggest you put some of your passwords on a piece of paper and then put it in a safe somewhere. Seriously, because it's actually quite tricky um, to uh, get hold of that information. If you're a creator, right? If you're an artist, if you're a musician, um, I think of that idea of uh, uh, lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, uh, one of the great thinkers of the Web2 world, um, uh, Tim O'Reilly, did this great pamphlet that said, you know, the real peril of an artist is not piracy, but posterity, right? That um, uh, uh, if you're overly protective about your data and who can get your data, you actually risk not um, uh, uh, preserving uh, your gift to the rest of the world because you, you've hoarded it like Scrooge McDuck. Um, I am, uh, uh, many people have um, uh, uh, pieces in their wills that actually say that, that our creative works will be licensed using Creative Commons after we die. Right? So that will mean that the Creative Commons license specifically enables people to make copies. So there will be no orphan works for those people because we've, we've given our creative works, whether they like it or not, but I'm not sure my creative works really deserve posterity, but we've given it to society and committed it to the public domain during that period where copyright controls people's ability to share information, but the person who created that data is no longer around. It's a terrible, dangerous moment for data. So what happens in corporate death, right? What happens if um, uh, a company like Google um, disappears from the, from, from the world? We think of companies like Google and uh, uh, Facebook and uh, Microsoft a bit like um, uh, we think about IBM now, right? IBM, as I said at the beginning of this talk, is, is over 100 years old now. Um, and so our presumption is sort of that these companies uh, play, will play that same role, that they will actually uh, outlive us all and keep that data safe. But in the same way as when we made that transition from vinyl to CD in the misplaced assurance that CD was going to give us um, better protection against the vagaries of age and decay than vinyl was, and that turned out not to be true. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that placing our trust in these centralized companies is going to have the same thing for a couple of reasons. One is, even if companies don't die per se, you never know who their owners are going to be, right? So the story of Flickr, and Flickr, by the way, Flickr.org is the organization that we funded, which is a nonprofit that the company SmugMug, brilliant people, family-owned firm, isn't going to go away anytime soon. It's probably one of the most trustworthy hands to put the huge set of Flickr resources, which incidentally include things like the repository of the White House's photographs of the Obama uh, administration, vast uh, collections of NASA photography and so forth, right? Uh, Flickr.org was set up uh, by SmugMug and supported by Filecoin uh, to try and work out what to do. And they came up with the, uh, the name uh, of, of this talk, which is Data Lifeboats. So uh, uh, there's a huge amount of data on the Flickr repository, and we see this all, all over. Um, seven exabytes sounds a lot. Um, but in fact, um, uh, it's uh, 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 more and more data is being stored every day. We could probably take, I don't know, a couple of copies of the current internet and store it on our network. Um, but e there's more information happening all the time. And as AI, because I'm contractually obliged to mention AI uh, because we're a consensus, um, one of the things about we know about AI is that um, its, uh, its cutoff point right now is not in the time it takes to store or the compute, computational power, it's how much data the models can take. So we're gonna have this new suite to take in even more data, and where are we gonna store it? I trust you'll store it on Filecoin, but how do we store it for the long term? And how do we store it if the companies that we're storing it with I've a change ownership, right? So 
the story of uh, Flickr's near-death experience, the story of GeoCities' death, came because it went from what people thought were a trustworthy pair of hands to one that was less trustworthy. Lawyers, check to see whether I can mention Yahoo at this point. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, and there's another problem, right? Remember I said earlier on that lots of copies keep stuff safe, right? That you want heterogeneous which is a fancy word that I can't spell, to mean um, uh, uh, differently constructed networks, different ways of thinking about storing, different mediums, uh, geogra geographical diversity, right? Um, uh, if lots of copies keep stuff safe and diversity of storage is something that we know is the way to preserve data for the long term, what does it mean that we all end up storing all of our data in like three or four companies, all of whom probably use Amazon on the back end anyway, right? Um, in some ways, like it's, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna dismiss the hard work and, and frankly commercial demands that require those companies to work out ways of protecting data. If you scratch a centralized um, company, uh, like Google, like Amazon, you'll actually find a decentralized distributed network underneath it because they understand, right, that they don't want to store all the data in an earthquake zone, right? They want to store this geographically diverse in a di ge geographically diverse way, but they're still homogenous, right? There's still the possibility that we're storing everything in a single library as people stored because they felt it was safe, all of the world's knowledge in the library of Alexandria, because you would, like nobody got fired for storing their scrolls in the library of Alexandria, right? Until, until it burns. And I'm not being, um, uh, I'm being a little morbid, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not, trying to say that this is going to happen, except that it's kind of inevitable. Uh, and we need to think about that. So, um, so we, to sort of wrap up, you know, the reason why I was talking about um, life and death and the future and morbidity is that it's very easy in context like this in rapid technological change to think of is everything, you know, what's going to happen in the next few weeks? Oh my God, like what, you know, what token is going to be up? What token is going to be down? Like where should I, 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 I make my next contract? But there's an important part of what we do collectively that requires us to think about the long term. We do this at Filecoin, right? We have, we have um, an, an online market for storage and it's an absolute, you know, foam of, of, of market dynamics, right? There are strong incentives to all of those um, storage providers on our network to keep and store data. Um, our consensus system is a, a proof of storage um, built by um, some, some genuinely like hard math. Sometimes this stuff is kind of hand wavy, but we were one of the first um, uh, networks to really explore zero knowledge snarks to, um, uh, 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 to, to create something where our storage providers or the network storage providers genuinely have to provide proofs that they've stored data um, every 30 seconds or so and make that a, a conceivable thing. Um, blockchains also have this amazing thing. So let me give you an idea about mortality and foolishness. I was, um, I, in a previous life, I was a journalist um, and in 2010, there's a lot of people who know this story because uh, it's whenever I get drunk, I tell people. Um, in 2010, I wrote one of the first articles about Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's called something like, imagine your future with a wallet full of Bitcoins. It was to the Irish Times. And in order to um, test out this newfangled thing of Bitcoin, I, um, I bought $70 worth of Bitcoin. Bitcoin at the time was 25 cents. Um, as you can tell, because I'm talking at a booth, um, I wasn't quite as hodly as maybe I could have done. A lot of that Bitcoin went on pizza. Um, a lot of that, I bought a great mattress, which was actually a terrible mattress and didn't last much longer than a boom bust. Um, and uh, uh, a really good piece of Bitcoin soap. There was a, um, a woman in San Francisco who made uh, soap with Bitcoin thing in it. I imagine she's retired very happily at this point because I think it was one Bitcoin per piece of soap. Anyway, um, the, the, the point here is that in that article, I said, I, 
I don't know whether Bitcoin's going to be a success, but I cannot see it disappearing from the world, right? Because the feature of a blockchain is you're always pushing forward. There's always an incentive to mine the next block. And I mean, this is good and bad, right? We've seen a huge attempt uh, by people concerned about the climate effect of uh, Bitcoin and other um, uh, 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 proof of work chains, right? And we've seen regulators try and control of this. It's very hard to stop that forward movement. So in many ways, I feel like you know, one of the few immortal, immortal systems is probably going to be blockchain based. But this is by the by, right? The important thing here is uh, that we need to construct data lifeboats, right? So my last thought for you here is to read Flickr.org's um, uh, 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 article about their plans to create data lifeboats to uh, enable when sites shut down uh, to create these storage things that can be filled up with a little bit of data and then we can store it safely. It's, um, it's a great project um, uh, funded by the NIH and uh, we're hoping to be able to implement something like that on Filecoin. Think about your, your, your own data. Um, think about making lots of copies. Um, I'm not sure, like, you know, I'm not a salesman, I'm, 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 I'm an impoverished journalist or whatever I am, right? But, but um, uh, uh, think about that possibility of not like, you know, I, I think I can be realistic and say, you know, um, to take that risk of moving all of your data from a centralized storage system to a decentralized storage system is, is a risky act, right? But making two copies of your data is, is an act of confidence, right? That's something that reduces risk. And I would consider one of the things that we talk about a lot at our network is that there are other decentralized networks around and the safest thing to do would be to make copies on all of those networks. So think about that, right? Think about the different nature of resilience and uh, mortality in the uh, digital realm. And finally, think about the future. Um, one of my favorite projects, and it's actually where we have our board meetings for the Filecoin Foundation in San Francisco, is um, the, uh, uh, the Clock of the Long Now. Uh, the Clock of the Long Now uh, was founded by Stuart Brand, one of my heroes, Brian Eno, uh, the musician, and it's a plan to build a clock that can last for 10,000 years. It's a clock that ticks every year, bongs every century, and a little cuckoo comes out every millennium. Um, you get to see some of the infrastructure there. They're actually building it out in a mountain, um, and it's being powered by the thermal, um, uh, the thermal power of the Earth. Think about what technology is going to look like for the next 10,000 years. It's one of the things we really try and do in Filecoin, and I think it gives you a new and better view of, um, of what you're doing and, uh, and where we're going. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great tail end of the conference. And you're all going to live forever. Don't worry about the death.